So uh, yesterday we uh, uh, looked at uh, this example of a uh, model fitting problem and uh, whether it's uh, seismogram data um, and a uh, source time function or uh, uh, maybe a uh, uh, maybe travel time data and a tomographic model, you know, the same sort of system applies. Um, so, uh, uh, oh gosh, now I have to switch. Uh, um, I have to switch uh, tools. Let's see, because I'm trying to click on the uh, click on the mouse button to get the recording to show it better. All right. Yes. Okay. Now that's now that's working. So uh, we uh, we have these problems where uh, we don't have we might have terabytes of data, but they're they're not. Uh, we still don't have a problem that's well determined. So we end up you know estimating part of it with x hat, and then still having this x naught which which we can't we can't determine. Um, now, how do we how do we work on that? Uh, uh, as uh, as I taught Tyler in uh, uh, in applied geophysics, we have to bring more than one kind of measurement to bear. Uh, we have to bring our geological intuition to bear. Uh, we have to bring geological observations and mapping to bear. So, uh, you know, just because we can only do so much with any particular data set or any particular you know range of data sets, doesn't mean we can't solve the problem. Okay. Um, we have to start combining. So in 757, we will talk about uh, iterative estimation um, using uh, a conjugate. Uh, as you can see, it's written here a prime to indicate that it's both the uh, transpose and the conjugate of the operator. Um, and uh, in preference to uh, the unstable process of, of finding a inverse. Um, because a is just full of zero eigenvalues in uh, almost all of our problems, um, and thus we have the uh, the interplay, the contrast between processing and inversion. And uh, processing, you know, in, in Clairbout's PVI book, processing is the use of a conjugate, and inversion is the use of a inverse. Um, now, of course, the, the iteration has to be controlled. You have to know when to stop the iteration, and you have to iterate on something that's meaningful. Um, and you can control the, uh, the iteration based on different kinds of norms. And um, uh, there's a lot of uh, work that's been done on um, using what's what it's called here the L2 norm. That's basically uh, looking at the... Um, uh, at the mean uh, or the uh, the RMS, if you like, of the difference between a particular model x sub i for iteration number i and um, uh, and uh, 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 a true model, or or uh, between uh, uh, data and uh, as m and uh, uh, and uh, uh, predicted data. Uh, but you don't have to use the L2 norm. You can also, in the presence of a lot of noise, which you know sometimes in time series analysis, you know we have incredible amounts of noise that can uh, really skew any mean. Okay, because the mean is too dependent on on uh, you know if there's large values or spikes in the data, then the mean is uh, uh, can be meaningless. Um, so then we we want to use the median, and there. Um, it's more like we're using the uh, absolute value of the difference instead of the squares, um, and uh, that that does uh, uh, you know control the uh, uh, the iteration differently, uh, and it responds very differently to uh, uh, to noise, especially high amplitude noise. Um, and so here's a, a little uh, kind of a teaser on. Uh, the use of these conjugate operators in processing versus uh, inversion. Okay, um, and and uh, in this little teaser, uh, the term modeling I use uh, um, as uh, kind of a 
um, uh, uh, it, it can also uh, it can also uh, 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 mean inversion sometimes. Um, so uh, there are advantages of uh, using conjugate operators over inversion. I mean, uh, if you take uh, uh, John Anderson's 705 class, uh, you'll find out a lot about uh, uh, inversion, um, especially for uh, various geophysical data sets. And uh, you know, inversion is time tested. Um, there's you know zillions of papers on inversion theory and application, and and in every given field. You know, somebody's got got an inversion. You know, and it and it, and it can do certain things. Um, but uh, inversions, unfortunately, do not tolerate incomplete data sets. They do not tolerate imperfections in the data. They don't tolerate inconsistent data. Um, and uh, uh, that's really a, a limitation that has. Um, Brought many of us who have very large data sets to uh, to want to take a different tack. Okay, so some of us have have in some sense set aside working on inversions in favor of working on processing using conjugate operators, and it turns out that uh, uh, it's it's easier actually to uh, to work with uh, conjugate operators than. Than, uh, than with inversions because you know developing an inversion is is a highly non-trivial process. I mean if you if you develop an inversion for um, uh, a, you know for for a new kind of data into a new kind of model, I mean that's worth a PhD thesis at least, um, and uh, that uh, 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 you know it's it's. Uh, um, uh, if you if you have a uh, a program a code to do forward modeling of some kind, you know let's say we have a code that uh, that convolves uh, uh, the source time function with uh, with an Earth response and gives us a, a, a synthetic seismogram. Okay, um, we'll talk about what it takes to do the deconvolution to do the actual inversion, and and it's a totally different code. Turns out though. That as soon as you have that forward modeling code, or or that that forward code, uh, you know, say that convolution code, with very very few changes, you can make a conjugate processing code. It uh, there there are codes, uh, and you'll encounter them in this class where going from a uh, 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 you know, and maybe this is a 500 line um, Java code or C code, going from a um, uh, going from a um, uh, a forward modeling to a conjugate uh, processing code is no more difficult than changing one character out of the out of those 5, 500 lines. Okay, um, it has to be exactly the right character, of course, but but. It's uh, it's just one character, okay. Uh, very often a minus sign instead of a plus sign. So here's some examples uh, of things where um, the uh, uh, you know the forward process, which we could call modeling here, you know, accomplishes something. And maybe I'll come. I'll be able to comment on 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 uh, what the inverse would be. And and here's the uh, and we have you know we would have a code for each of these things, uh, you know a, a computer uh, program, and uh, uh, and then here's the uh, on the right is the processing, uh, uh, what the processing uh, uh, method would be called. Okay, uh, so matrix multiply, all right, uh, the uh, the processing step. Is conjugate transpose matrix multiply. The inverse would be um, would be uh, uh, matrix inversion and uh, and multiplication. Okay, um, and you know taking the uh, making taking the inverse of a matrix. You know that can be for some matrices it's it's easy it's automatic for others it can be a very very tricky process. Okay. 
uh, taking the conjugate transpose of a matrix is always automatic. You don't have to fool with it. You just say, "I want the conjugate transpose," and 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 it's you know it's totally deterministic what what has to be done. Okay, convolution. All right, filtering. Okay, the inverse is inverse filtering. All right, but the 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 processing, the conjugate. Transpose of convolution turns out to be cross correlation. Now we're going to talk about convolution very soon here, um, and uh, uh, and then cross correlation will come up later. So you will learn exactly what these are. Uh, let's say we uh, uh, and this is done all the time in in you know with uh, volumes of seismic data. You know we and I was just talking about it uh, with Barrick this morning. Uh, we want to take a, a seismic volume. We want to stretch it from time to depth. Okay, so stretching. All right. Uh, an inverse stretch is is rather difficult to program, but a squeeze is actually the conjugate transpose, and that's what that's what we would think of as as an inverse uh, as an inverse stretch. Um, so so what seems most natural. As a uh, as uh, as an inverse stretch is actually the convert it is actually the conjugate transpose. Uh, another thing we often do with data is zero padding. Okay, and that could be as as simple as filling in you know around the edges of the data set. Right, you fill in with that green color and open the tech, which means there's no data there. That's zero padding. Okay, and then uh, now, now the inverse of zero padding is is actually quite difficult. But the conjugate transpose is very natural. It's just truncation. It's just removing the green part that's zero. Okay, very simple. Um, we're going to develop uh, uh, upward continuation for uh, seismic imaging. Uh, I'm sorry. We're going to develop downward continuation to uh, for seismic imaging. It's actually the uh, the conjugate transpose of upward continuation, and. Um, and if you're, and this is of wave fields, and if you're, if you talk about inverting upward continuation, you're really talking about, uh, you know, wave propagation. Uh, so, so uh, the inverse is 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 much more difficult than the uh, than the processing. Uh, we'll find out about a uh, procedure called diffraction, which turns out to be the modeling procedure, and uh, we're going to study in this class, uh, in the second half of this class. A procedure called migration, which is an essential part of, of seismic imaging, and uh, it ter it's the uh, uh, the processing uh, uh, conjugate to diffraction. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, uh, earthquake uh, uh, velocity uh, uh, analysis, uh, uh, you may be familiar with ray tracing, and the uh, and the inverse is uh, quite difficult. Again, it's really wave propagation, uh, but the uh, the processing step is just tomography. Okay, so we'll uh, uh, we'll uh, uh, th these are, are all examined in, in great detail in um, in seven fifty seven. Um, but I, I want to give you a, a, a just a bit of a teaser here. All right. So now, now it's time to dig into the uh, the nitty gritty of uh, of how we represent time series, and then what can we do with them to transform them into these different domains. Remember, uh, uh, we had um, this uh, uh, diagram of the uh, of the the different domains of our. Uh, uh, you know, we're gonna. Uh, we have the continuous time domain, which we can sample into the discrete time domain, and that's what we're going to start with now. And we're going to use the Z-transform to actually get into the continuous frequency domain. So that's where we're that's where we're headed at the moment. Okay. Good heavens! Got to get control of my mouse here. All right. So, so uh, here's a here's a continuous function at the upper left, um, and uh, uh, you know that's some sort of uh, physical signal, a voltage appearing on a wire. We put it through a uh, analog to digital converter, 
and we digitize it at a constant time interval delta t. Okay, uh, so the bison does this, the Texans do this, the seismograph seismometers in the field do this, your phone does it. Um, uh, you know, all kinds of devices uh, uh, have these A to D converters in now, and we get a series of numbers. And each of these is a sample of the value of that time series at a particular time. And um, uh, because we're talking about seismology here and not um, geospatial data, I'm, I'm, I'm really not going to talk much about the case where, where the sample interval is not even. Okay. Because in, in seismology, we, we're always evenly sampling in time. Okay. Uh, we, we will have to start dealing with, with having uneven sampling in space, uh, but that's a, you know, we're going to start simple first, okay? Even sampling in time, time series. Seismogram is the prototype, really, prototype example. Uh, you will see me write down these numbers, this time series, in several forms. I can write it in an ordered list, which I might uh, use these curly braces to uh, represent. Um, so the ordered list, you know, has the f has the sample at at delta t at, at one at zero delta t here, and then next co after a comma comes the sample at at one delta t. Uh, after another comma, the sample at two delta t, and so forth. We c I might write it down as a vector, okay, and um, uh, the vector, uh, um, uh, I'll draw a little half arrow at the, at the top of it to, uh, uh, to indicate that it's a vector. Uh, and if I have long pages of such equations, I, I might drop the arrow, uh, just, a, just a warning. Um, you can point it out, I can draw the arrow in, you know, just for clarity. Um, and, uh, and, and so then um, the components of a vector are within parentheses and they're separated by uh, um, by commas still, and so you're basically putting those ordered lists. The, those or, instead of just an ordered list, it becomes uh, each element of that ordered list becomes a, a component of a vector. And so here's a concept. Uh, you know, uh, I'm showing you uh, uh, four numbers here and then some. Okay, and that's what that ellipsis is is there for. Um, and and uh, the the vector is um, uh, has at least five numbers in it then, okay. And I'm going to talk about that vector as being five dimensional. Now, obviously, uh, you know, even in string theory, uh, I don't think it goes beyond twelve or twenty one dimensions. So we're not talking about physical dimensions here. We're talking about a mathematical concept of dimensionality, which turns out to be very useful because a lot of the, you know, we're, you know, you and I are used to dealing with vectors in 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 space, you know, x, y, and z, you know, because we we talk a lot about locations and directions, um, you know, and distances. So so we're very used to doing that. Um, and, and we know all kinds of operations that we can do with vectors, like uh, we can, um, you know, we can uh, project vectors uh, uh, by taking a dot product. Uh, uh, we can get gradients of vectors and, and things like that. Um, so uh, uh, all of those operations are still valid, even for a twenty-five thousand dimensional vector. And and okay, I'm not saying twenty five thousand to impress you. I'm saying that there are twenty five thousand samples in the time series. That's all. Okay, and we can use a you know even though even though we can't even there's no way I could imagine a space with that many spatial uh, components. Uh, there's a lot of simple vector operations that that we can still apply to that uh, to that. You know, high dimensionality vector. But isn't it a matrix, not a vector? I mean, like because that has no time, so we're just assuming every space over is you know the same time interval. Um, like, no, because I, 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 
in, in most of the equations I'll show you where I, where I regard you know, a time series as a vector, um, uh, if, if matrices are involved, the time series will be a column vector. And, and then the matrix then will have a time series, say, on each row, or conversely, a time series in each column. Yeah, but where are the times that go with each of those values? Ah, that's, see, that's, that's right, right. So that's that's the 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 the, the simplicity we get from from assuming constant delta t. Okay, uh, right. I I I I don't need to, um, you know, really, uh, and and you could think of this, you know, really, I should have an array of structures where this this, uh, you know, instead of just this one scalar here. You know that should be the amplitude part of the structure, and and the other parts of the data structure would would tell you the time, you know, would tell you the location, uh, and and many other things, you know. Um, but uh, uh, at least as seismologists, we, we do get very used to dealing with with these these size, seismograms, where we make the assumption of constant delta t, and and then we have to remember, oh, we have to know what that delta t is. So that's that's got to be somewhere else, okay. and 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 in all too many of the equations that I'll show you, there will be the assumption that delta t is one, and one what? Well, who knows? But um, you know that that uh, yeah. So so for for simplicity on the on the page, you know, there's all this stuff behind it, and if we were geographers, uh, we would get very confused very fast. But I think as seismologists, we we won't be we won't get confused. Uh, but quite true. Okay, so now um, look at how simple this is. Um, you know, with all those assumptions, with the constant delta t, um, with the uh, uh, um, you know, we take this ordered list, which we could render as a vector. We can also render the ordered list as a z transform. All right, so. Um, uh, let's say uh, uh, let's say this zero here is at uh, at minus one times uh, delta t. That's its time. The one is at uh, uh, zero times delta t. Okay, and here's the uh, here's the z transform. Um, so you take the first element of the ordered list and you multiply it. It becomes the coefficient of this z thing. I'm not going to explain what z is just yet. Okay. Um, so just call it z, and it's z to the power of minus one. It's z to the power of the of the of the time index. Okay. So that's that's that zero is the amplitude at minus one times delta t. So it's the coefficient is zero times z to the minus one power, and then you add. The next uh, uh, element, okay, that's that's a regular plus sign, um, and uh, uh, you take the next element off the ordered list. The coefficient is one times z to the power of the time index, which is zero, z to the zeroth power, which of course anything to the zeroth power is one, all right. But we'll we'll leave it as z to the zeroth power for the moment, okay, uh, plus. Two times uh, that's the next element in the ordered list z to the first power plus zero. That just happens to be the, the amplitude of the next uh, uh, element of the ordered list. Uh, the coefficient is zero times z to the second power, and so forth. Okay, and it will you know if if there are twenty five thousand time samples in that ordered list, then we're going to get up to z to the uh, twenty five thousandth power. Okay, and, and here's a a, a, summa, a short you know summation shorthand. I mean, I haven't put the the limits on the summation, but uh, uh, it's a summation shorthand for for that uh, um, for that z transform. Now, uh, what you should recognize here is that we are building a polynomial in z. So the z transform of little x of the of the vector or time series little x. Is called big X, capital X, and that is it. This is saying that that is a uh, X is a Z polynomial, uh, is a polynomial in Z. 
Okay, which means z is the thing that gets the exponents, right? So, so it's really just a way of making this ordered list into a polynomial. Now, it's a polynomial in this mysterious z thing, and we're going to talk uh, uh, until I'm very tired of it about what z is. Z actually has several different interpretations. Okay. Uh, all right. So here, what 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 is it first? Um, it's not a number. It's it turns out to be an operator itself, and it's the unit delay operator. Okay. It shifts entries. Uh, well, I said forward in time, but what I really mean is it 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 delays an entry in time. Right. So we have. Um, you know, let's say we, we, we take this z polynomial here and we multiply it by z, right? So, uh, so, so then we uh, uh, bring that into the, uh, the summation. And so we, instead of summing up x sub i times z uh, to the power of i plus 1, we have, uh, instead, of, instead of x sub i times z to the, to the power of i, which is a time index, then we have now uh, an extra z in there, so we have x sub i times z to the power of i plus one. Okay, so now instead of um, instead of you know having the zero at uh, at z to the minus one, we have the zero at uh, at z to the zero power, which means that we have jumped. Back in time, one times delta t. So every time we multiply by z, and this is the same thing as applying the unit delay operator. Okay, we we shift the whole the whole um, uh, we shift the whole uh, time series back in time by one. Well, not not to the previous time. We we sh we delay it by one delta one delta t. Okay. Uh, if we want to advance the series in the other in the other direction, okay, we just multiply it by z inverse. Z to the power of minus one becomes the unit advance operator. Okay, so we can move these back and forth in time. If we want to delay the whole time series by by uh, five hundred samples, we would multiply it by z to the power of five hundred. Okay. Now, now um, let's just see what we can do with this uh, polynomial. All right, it's not a it's not an ordered list. It's not a vector. It's it's a polynomial in Z. And so, uh, and Z being uh, you know Z still obeys even though it's this funny operator, it still obeys algebra. You know, so there's anything you can do to a polynomial, you can do to a Z polynomial. All right. So you know that that you can add polynomials, right? Um, and so uh, uh, and and you also know that you can add time series. And and it, and so by adding uh, z polynomials, we end up adding time series. So let's say we have a a wave. Okay, maybe maybe this little wavelet here is this. Uh, is this uh, time series that, that we've been working on, you know, as ordered list, as vector, or as z transform? Okay, so here's that little that little wavelet plotted out. Okay, that's x of z. All right, we can take x of z. We can we can multiply it by z to the tenth power, and we can shift it down by ten times delta t, and then we can add the, the two polynomials together. Right, so we have uh, the x of z polynomial. We have z to the tenth power times the x to the z polynomial, and uh, and so that's basically just another repeat of this uh, of this little wavelet. And 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 now, right, this is starting to look a little bit like some of our seismic reflection uh, seismograms. You know, we got we got what we're looking for in those are these reflection wavelets. And we want to see them at different times, and thus at different depths. Okay, and and so you know we can use this. Just proves that we can we can you know use uh, uh, you know addition of polynomials 
to, to you know to get that linear superposition of wavelets that we need to represent uh, a reflection seismogram. Okay. Um, let's see another another you know linear another another thing that proves a linear operator. Let's say let's say the uh, the second the second polynomial was I'm sorry the second wavelet you know a, a deeper reflection should be less amplitude in general. So you know what if we wanted to make this wavelet uh, half the amplitude of the first of the first wavelet? Well, we would just multiply uh, in front of 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 the, the same x polynomial, uh, you know, we have the z to the tenth power to shift it in time, and we would also have a factor of one half in front of here, and that, of course, you know, you multiply that into the z polynomial, and we get distributed in to to you know basically all of these coefficients of z would get uh, uh, multiplied by one half, and so that that works just the way we think it should as well. Okay, no problem. Uh, um, Generating a uh, 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 you know composing a seismogram that way. All right, let's go to the next step up. All right, um, what about this uh, uh, this operator called convolution? Um, have either of you ever ever um, heard of or dealt with convolution before? Okay, so you've you've seen uh, the integral equation for convolution, maybe. Okay, and and have you ever have you ever uh, uh, programmed it in a computer? Uh, but okay, but you know what convolution is supposed to do anyway. So so um, all right. So uh, later I will show you the the uh, uh, the integral form of uh, you know convolution for continuous uh, uh, signals, um, but here. Uh, all, I, all I want to do is show you that you can accomplish convolution by multiplying z polynomials, right? The z polynomial, which is the time series or any time series, right? So it's clear. Sh several things should be clear. You can make any time series into a z polynomial. Uh, I suppose it has to be the the time series has to be of of. Um, uh, um, Scalars, um, you know, we, we can't have a, a, a time series of vectors represented as, as a z polynomial. That's one thing, say, that the ordered list lets you do that you can't do with uh, with a z polynomial. So we're talking about a, a scalar amplitude, basically. Um, it could be this, you know, a, a complex number. I still consider that a scalar. Okay. So, so the uh, those coefficients could be complex. All right, we got We'll we'll allow that later on explicitly. Um, but uh, we have a scalar. All right, and and our time series is just a you know it's just a list of scalars, and so the coefficients on our z polynomials they're all scalars. All right, they're not they're not vectors. They're not they're not uh, matrices. You know they're they're scalars. Um, so, so a scalar uh, a polynomial, a polynomial with scalar co coefficients, right? You can you know how to multiply that by another polynomial that, uh, of of scalar coefficients, right? So uh, 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 here's our example, right? This this time series we've composed. We have uh, you know we have the the original signal, and then it's followed by you know after uh, ten. Time steps delay. It's followed by the uh, 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 the scaled signal, scaled at one half. Okay, so we have uh, one half z to the tenth power um, times the uh, the x polynomial uh, x uh, x of z is is one way I'll call it. And here's x of z out by itself. So that's the the original version that comes first. Okay. And okay, so here's a polynomial. Um, we can factor this without even writing out, you know, what x of z is, right? It might have it might have twenty thousand. Uh, uh, what do you call the the elements of a polynomial? Uh, it's not components of a vector, but the polynomial could have uh, oh, could have twenty five thousand terms or more, right? If we got a time series. So I'm 
I'm not going to write it out. I'm just going to write it as x. But just using algebra, right? I can I can factor it out. And, and here is another z polynomial, right? And the z polynomial is one, the coefficient one, times z to the zeroth power, right? Which is one. So I'm not showing it. Okay. So the 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 zero uh, uh, the uh, the the at zero time. 0 times delta t, the coefficient is 1. And then we, we have 1 plus 1 half z to the 10th power. So we have a coefficient of 1 half um, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at 10 times, um, at, at 10 times uh, 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 delta t. So, so uh, what's the value you know, within this little time series here? Uh, well, okay. So with this little z polynomial here, all right. What's what's the coefficient at uh, at uh, at z to the fifth power? Yeah, it's not it's not there, right? So it's zero. What's the coefficient at z to the second power? Zero. Okay. What's the coefficient at z to the minus two hundred fifty thousand power? Zero. Okay. So. So you know we we've written it down here. It's only got it's only got two non-zero coefficients, so that's all we have to write. But uh, you know it could be, you know there there could be anything in here. But we define you know by writing it down so simply we've defined it very simply. Okay, so we factor that out. You know whatever x is that's that's there by itself now, and uh, and then here here we've derived another time series, right? Because every Every z polynomial defines a time series, okay. Um, and uh, uh, what does this time series look like? Okay. Well, at zero time, it's uh, it's uh, it's got a coefficient of one. At uh, at at uh, time ten, it's got a coefficient of one half. And everything else is zero in between and outside. So we have two. Uh, uh, well, they're not they're not strictly direct delta functions because a direct delta function is a is a continuous concept, but they're they're two discretized delta functions. Okay, um, you know, easy to represent in the computer um, as a as a time series, and it's only got two non-zero um, uh, elements, you know, one and one half. And and uh, so this time series is being this this z polynomial is being multiplied by this uh, this z polynomial, right? And and what is that giving us, right? This this here is that that wave, you know, these two signals that uh, we have. This looks like what we ought to get if we take this spike series and we convolve it with with this wavelet here. Take these two spikes, convolve with this wavelet, and you get you get that that same you know you get those repeated wavelets. That's what convolution is supposed to do. So um, uh, we've got um, uh, now we can say let's call this polynomial here f of z. We still have the x polynomial, and so what we we can see we're really doing is we're taking this uh, 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 this spike series here f, and we're convolving it with x, and that's giving us some data y. Okay, so uh, uh, and in in uh, you know say reflection uh, terms, maybe these are uh, or scaled reflection coefficients at two interfaces. And here's the uh, the vibrator uh, uh, correlated vibrator wavelet, and uh, and then here's the reflection seismogram. You know that would be that would be uh, what the uh, uh, what well log modeling will do. You know as done simply in Open Detect or, or Kingdom. Okay, so so multiplying the two time series the two z polynomials is the same thing exactly the same thing as uh, as convolving the two time series. Uh, another thing you might notice is that the this polynomial multiplication commutes. You know, 
starting with f and then convolving it with x, since since these coefficients are all real, okay, not only are they scalar but they're real, then is commutative. And and at least we're starting with with real time series, okay. So uh, uh, convolution then convolution of real time series is is commutative, and and maybe we already knew that, all right. Here's another way of, of writing the convolution. So the data time series y of t is the convolution, and there's the star, of f, uh, the convolution of f of t against x of t. Okay. Now uh, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's write out the, uh, remember we had the summation form of the, uh, of the z polynomial, right? So here's, here's this particular z polynomial in summation form, and here's the definition, I guess. Um, so we bring that summation form down here, and we just write out y, you know, the y, uh, w the polynomial y of z um, in summation form. It's got its components y sub i, i is the time index, uh, times uh, z to the power of i. Uh, and uh, now we know that that is the same as um, as this polynomial multiplied by this one, and we and we write out uh, uh, we write out f. So here's f, okay, and and you see it's written generally f uh, at time zero times z to the zeroth power plus f at time one the f component at time one times z to the first power plus f at time two times z squared and then so on. And then here's x written out as a z polynomial. So if we do this, uh, uh, you know, let's say we wanted to multiply these two polynomials, okay? Then um, you know you could use this little table to go through that. Um, I'll leave that as an exercise to you guys if you want to if you want to verify that that works. Um, but here's the here's the multiplication in in summation form. And uh, at least on a page near five in, in the PVI book, uh, which I have in, in uh, uh, PDF form for you, uh, there's actually a, a you know short little program that does that. You know, it's like a five line program that does this uh, summation convolution. So that's discrete convolution. Uh, you know, we're summing over uh, uh, time indices here, and uh, we're summing. Um, uh, uh, x in the forward direction, but notice this is f at k minus i. So we're summing, uh, uh, you know, multiplying against uh, f in the in the in the reverse direction. And then uh, this might be familiar here as convolution written out in continuous form. Again, I, I've dropped the limits on the integral because I don't want to I don't want to have to specify what they are, and I, I and I've never. You know, in, in practice, I'm never going to deal with uh, infinite, infinitely long time series. So, uh, so I just ignore the limits for now. So x at uh, lag tau um, times f at uh, at uh, lag t minus tau, right? And that gives you, uh, you know, summing over all uh, all lags tau gives you uh, uh, y at uh, t. And actually, I should have called t the lag actually uh, in this kind of uh, convolution or cross correlation. Uh, t is what's called the lag. So let's say uh, uh, let's say we were deriving y one, and I'm going to try to visualize what's going on in the computer. <laughs> we uh, we take f and we reverse it. Okay, that's what uh, this summation is doing up here, and uh, so you know f is written in reverse order. F f f at Zero time is here. F at delta t is here. F at two delta t is over here, uh, and and uh, to to derive uh, y one, you know y at the output at time one, we are just going to take uh, x at zero times f at zero. So so there is x at zero, and then to derive you know to go to get further samples of y, see to get to uh, y two. We're going to move. We're going to move this over by one, and so then f zero will be multiplied by by x one, and also then x zero will will be overlapping with f one, 
and uh, and we'll build it up according to this. Uh, it, it actually will work just like this summation right here. So uh, and and you know condensed into this uh, is 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 an awful lot that's uh, important in 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 uh, so, so, you know this this. For for any for any operator, so here we're exploring the the convolution operator. For any operator, we're going to learn to do it in several different ways. Okay, um, you know we might start with the continuous integral form of the operator. You know right here, um, and then uh, we're going to derive a uh, uh, a, uh, a discrete form. You know, which is a summation instead of an integral, and then we might implement that as a computer program. And in trying to debug my programs, I'm I'm always trying to figure out, okay, what's what's going on with the data? How is it, you know, how is this working? I try to visualize the data in the uh, in, in in RAM and what I'm trying to do with it. What am I overlapping? What am I multiplying? You know, uh, uh, you know, this is really like a dot product, right? We take the overlapping part and we make a dot product, you know. Um, so uh, 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 you know that's how I try to check that out. And now we know also that uh, this operator at least has a very simple representation uh, for for z uh, transforms. Okay, it's the multiplication of two z polynomials. So convolution is polynomial multiplication. It's uh, it's an integral. It's a uh, it's a summation. It's a computer program which I visualize this way. Um, you know, if 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 you're at the stage where you, you may be exploring some new operator, and uh, you're not going to completely understand it until you have the operator in all these forms. You know, and some of them, you know, some operators are just impossible to visualize on paper, uh, and maybe the closed form. You know the integral form is is too complicated to write on paper, but uh, uh, you know if you can get into a summation form or a polynomial multiplication, and then uh, write a program, then uh, uh, then you can use it. Uh, but it is it is extremely useful to visualize it in all these forms. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to stop there.